I would, of course, have loved to be on Iceland instead of on Zoom, but this is also, I mean, a possibility to be here. Anyway, uh, I'm going to tell you, talk about uh, research uh, results, both that are a bit old, um, produced when I was young, and also how we have come to challenge them a bit with new perspectives in a new project, well, the project has been going on for a while, a project called uh, with the name Contesting Marginality, uh, which in which I'm working together with colleagues in Uppsala and Stockholm, including our Icelandic paleobotanist Sigrun, who's uh, uh, working in, uh, who has done the pollen analysis for this. Anyway, on this uh, first page here um, is uh, a modern tapestry. Um, from a pilgrim uh, route in, in, in the Western Sweden. The pilgrim route is not known from history, but it's a tradition. And this tapestry was made by a number of unemployed women who got that as a project. And the project leader had been to Bayeux and looked at the tapestry in Bayeux. And then he came home, let's make something like that. So it is, a, I think it's a 40 meter long, uh, tapestry embroidered like this with bit motives from uh, all in, in the geography from uh, an history from along this uh, assumed pilgrim route but also with little, little small things in the bottom you can see like trucks and lorries and, and stuff like that that you can meet today. Anyway, uh, we're moving to, uh, to it's, this is Western Sweden, Värmland, and you, there's a lot of spruce and some pine, and there's a lot of forest and also clear cut areas. And this is known as, area is known as uh, Sweden's <laughs> closest wilderness. Uh, it's, or, or even Europe's closest wilderness, but uh, there's been a lot of people living there. And of course it has a history, but it's not always what you think about as history. Uh, and when we started working in this area, this was the picture uh, that was told in all grand narratives. We are here, uh, let's see, I get the laser pointer on. Uh, you can see, I hope you can see the pointer. We are here in this area. And uh, the historians and archaeologists, the grand narrative was that these areas, here people had been living and settled in the Iron Age. And here uh, people were settling in the Middle Ages up till around 1500. These were colonization areas in the Middle Ages and these areas were colonized later. And we are in these areas and uh, results from these areas uh, uh, pointed in another direction. Before we started working, there were sites like this, Stone Age sites connected with hunter-gatherers from Mesolithic time that were known also pitfalls for elks were known, uh, but we started to date them. And then uh, we could see this is uh, an, an old picture of dating, it just fitted this picture. But we could see that the first, the oldest ones are from around 3000 BC, but most of them are actually Viking age and early mid middle ages. There's a strong concentration from around 900 to 1250 AD in areas where people are not supposed to have settled during this time. And also we know that uh, there can be uh, pitfalls like this can be connected, uh, can be depicted in uh, historical maps together with other assets uh, for the, pe the peasants own. And uh, we know from uh, this word here, Elgegravar means pitfalls. And this is how they could be depicted in, in older maps with the pits and the fences in between. And we know from, uh, from, uh, uh, fr from written documents from somehow that, uh, that you could inherit those. Uh, there is, there is a, a will made uh, where two daughters are dividing the farm. Uh, uh, this is a little bit further north. And, one, and they are saying that the daughters are dividing the assets equally and one daughter is uh, inheriting the farmstead and the other one is inherited the system of pitfalls. This is uh, the picture here is of a system of pitfalls when they are in long rows and have fences in between. And that says a little bit about the value of these pitfalls that they could be equaled to a farmstead in a productive way. 
Uh, sites we also found when we were uh, surveying was this, Bloomery iron production sites. Often we found the large slag heaps, charcoal pits, and uh, connected to them. And when we dated them, we could see that also here we have the earliest dates are from around 580 in this area, the younger dates from the 17th century, but there's a strong concentration to around 800 to 1200 AD. And the downturn around 1280 is very direct and very steep. There is a small upturn in the 14th century. Uh, and that upturn uh, here in this curve here is connected to an introduction of a new technology at these bloomery sites with better and more stable fur furnaces. And also you are changing the, the mode of production because uh, you also purify the, uh, the iron with, on anvil stones at the production sites. Uh, during the period 800 to 1200, they, they were bringing down the bloom to the farmsteads and making the work all there. And the younger, the younger production sites, they are very much smaller uh, in, in uh, concerning the slag heaps. They have produced very much less iron than during the 800 to 1200 AD when we have huge uh, slag heaps in the forests. And then uh, from early modern times, when we start having written sources uh, in this area, uh, it was inhabited with a lot of forest farmers who were farming and using the resources of the forest in various ways, hunting, forest grassing, including the use of shielings. Uh, on the picture you see a, a well, restored shielding that has been restored for as a museum, um, but it was deserted before they restored it. Uh, so, uh, but shielings are very common in these in these areas, and and as you know, of course, that shielings uh, were used during the summer for grassing uh, for grassing uh, cattle. When we started to study this area, we had a lot of different datings and and uh, the presumption that. They, these areas were not permanently settled by peasants until around 1500 AD and later. Uh, but these datings from the Bloomer Iron production sites and the pitfalls made us think that maybe we actually also had people living here at the time and not only, uh, not, not only production sites. Uh, we started to date shielings using paleobotany. It's, I would say, it's quite impossible to be have good datings on the shielings only by archaeology because they're two big sites you don't know where to dig and so on. So paleobotany has been a method we have used uh, for studying shielings here. And uh, a couple of years ago, I would have said that from our interdisciplinary studies, we were always mapping the shielings and then making pollen analysis and making some minor excavations as well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we would have said that what we have discovered was that we had a system of farmstead and shielings and outland use, that is with bloomery iron production and hunting and so on, that is established as a kind of innovation package for settlement uh, colonization around 500 AD and that things grew out of that. That was how what our datings from the shielings we were investigating and from the outland use, uh, uh, from the outland use uh, such as bloomer iron production and, uh, and uh, pitfalls, but also from excavations of, far, of uh, a farmstead. Uh, that that and also the use of place names that indicated that. So that was what we were thinking. Uh, okay, we were quite. We were quite. This was how everything looked like at, at the time. Uh, and the ceiling in this picture, Bakkasäten. Here we can see that it is uh, it, the ceiling is founded around 600 AD with with grassing and haymaking, but it is deserted around 900 and then reopened around 1400 AD again. And from there it goes on. So how we wanted to reinterpret the empty, the white or the little uh, prickly areas was that it was in fact a system that looked like this, uh, that colonized the area for permanent settlement. Of course, there have been hunter-gatherers before, but 
type of permanent settlements that you had a farmstead in small hamlets uh, where you have infields. We have excavated some um, remains of fields in, in, in and these are these uh, farmsteads are, are were located in uh, river valleys where you have in a bigger river valley where you had uh, more sediment soils and better areas for cultivation not very good areas for cultivation but better areas and then the big forests were used around uh, for pitfall hunting and for producing bloomery iron for haymaking, both on hard, uh, hard meadows and on uh, mires, and also for some, for some uh, cereal cultivation, because we have indication of cereal cultivation in the vast laying outlands in the forest. Uh, we don't find traces like this very often, but we find it in the pollen uh, diagrams. So this was how the system was kind of the innovation package that we saw that this, this all these parts were needed to make a good life in these areas as a peasant. And this was how we presumably it was been acting out uh, using the buzzwords commonality, versatility, seasonality and women because domesticating the rough environments and staging this innovation package required organization to have enough hands to carry out to what was needed done over large areas because it was the large areas that from where you needed to extract resources to make this work. And it seems that uh, at least when we when we see in written documents but also from how we interpret some of the archaeological remains that there was communality, cooperatives was the dominating way of working. And uh, very often you think that uh, commonality or cooperatives, uh, cooperatives that indicates that you have some kind of equal society. Uh, we don't think so, <laughs> but we think that equality was an important strategy to make this system work. You were kind of communicating equality, that everyone was equal, uh, or at least the settled peasants were, were equal. But that was not the reality, but it was a way of, of handling the internal uh, relations, social relationships uh, in, in these communities. We can also see that uh, in some of these areas, uh, you were kind of being specialized in different kinds of trades and then changing in between one another. Uh, in some other areas, they were doing jack of all trades, they were doing all kinds of things. So, but generally it seems that it's rather uh, work skills than land possession that was the important thing for generating status anyway. And we can see that there was no aristocracy. We don't have any nobility in these areas at all. But that doesn't mean that peasants are all equal. Uh, and they are all taxpaying self, uh, self uh, possessing peasants. Versatility was a cornerstone, this of carrying out different trades. As I said, there was a system of different things that were done. Uh, and that was, of course, a very good system also for risk management, as I will come back to. to. And also you had to spread out the work over the year to use the different seasons for doing different things. Like in the summer, you were taking care of uh, grassing and, and uh, cereal cultivation. In the winter, you were making iron, etc., etc. And least but not last, uh, women are working in shores that in many other places in Europe are carried out by men. For instance, this herding of cattle. Uh, I've been doing a lot of cooperating, cooperation with uh, uh, shillings is the wrong word, different ways of producing uh, transhumans <laughs> across Europe. And it seems to be mostly men doing it in Southern Europe. Uh, in, in the British Isles, it seems to be a mixture. And in Scandinavia, it seems to be women. Uh, and they were also, women are also present in other kinds of outland use. For instance, in this picture of a uh, a bloomery iron uh, production site where the woman is trampling the bellows while also of course spinning at the same time so that's uh, so that but that was a necessity to kind of work this because people the household is spread out uh, geographically <laughs> people are going to the shilling for the summer some are making iron and so on so 
you had to act like this to have seasonality and also to work together, but also to be mobile within the household. So uh, a bit later on, depending on where in Scandinavia, we have different datings. Uh, we can see that there are different trends on where uh, on when this production started, but most commonly from around 800 AD, large scale production of outland goods for sale of uh, everyday character, bloomer iron production, whetstones, quenstones, tar, antler, hides, etc. from and from elk and reindeers are starting to have this kind of large scale production and for sale. And from the products, uh, uh, where we can make some calculation of vol volume, uh, especially bloomer iron, we can see that there are tons of iron that it was being produced and sold from written in, from inland Scandinavia. And strange enough, there is not a single word about that in any written documents. And that's very, very strange. Or rather it has to do with who are the producers, peasants didn't write down things in that way. Uh, Large scale outland use was, of course, demanding. It was a lot of technical know how. You had to have a good organization of production, but also of distribution change, etc. But it has, it appears to have been very rewarding. Uh, there is a Norwegian, uh, Chetty Lofsgaard, who has been studying the distribution networks for Norway. They seem to have been ha having, uh, from inland Norway, where it have different, different stations. Uh, from the inland areas production down to the harbor like Bergen and so on. But uh, in many other cases, we don't see how these distribution networks were looking like. We're looking for the hubs uh, where there were minor traded places and so on, but we have not been very successful so far. But what we can see, for instance, from this site, uh, this is called Shin, this is a farmstead called Schinderud, dated to 900 to 1200, uh, around AD, that is during the glorious days of uh, outland production. Uh, here, the peasants in this site, we can see they were specializing in bloomer iron production and handling elk related products, especially skin. Uh, the name of the farms that is skin, <laughs> is skin and uh, in, in the four words. So, so that's also, we, and we could see, we could find a uh, skin, um, uh, and we can we can find tools for indicating skin skin um, working with skins. Uh, but what this uh, what we did not find at all was no spindle words, no indication of textile production, and uh, we could also see that they had really cut down on production of cereals for themselves. And this is also a time when this the the shielding connected to this farmstead is closed. So it appears that during this time, around 900 to 1200 or 800 to 1200, the farms that in these areas who are involved in large scale production of outland goods, they're cutting down on production for their self subsistence uh, in order to maximize production for sale. And we can also see that uh, from the finds that they were kind of, they, they were gaining some wealth, not only for themselves, but also for the community. There's uh, some nice, Ecclesi ecclesiastical arch, arch in the in the local church and so on. Uh, and what is this? We call this outland use, but it's also we could say that we we, we think that this kind of almost it reached some kind of industrial scale. Uh, and then, of course, economic historians get very angry because industry is something that the concept of industry is related to modernity capitalism, urbanization, and it should be about transforming a society from rural to an industrial society. Uh, anything remotely like industry in earlier periods or in rural settings are defined as something else. Uh, so, um, but we think that we are, we will say that we, we are dealing with some kind of industry in, in the outland using communities. And the picture I have here uh, remains of blast furnaces and mines and things related to the blast furnace production. And here is from the excavation of Lapputan, the earliest, uh, the earliest, uh, well, so far oldest 
well excavated and dated uh, blast furnace in the Swedish mining district, uh, dated to the uh, 12th century. And this is this is a kind of this is here you can really see that this, we are taking off in industry in this part. The blast furnace, uh, the blast furnace. But this, with the start of the blast furnace in the mining districts, had serious consequences for the bloomery iron production in other parts of Scandinavia. Uh, it seemed the blast furnace was so much more efficient, produced so pig iron, produced so much more, uh, better iron. So bloomery, large scale bloomery iron production could not keep up the competition. It became too hard a competition. And we can kind of see that, and that's also how we want to explain this, the steep downturn in the dating of the bloomer iron production in, uh, in Western Sweden around 1200. That is because we can see the my we think that it is now the pig iron from the mining districts that takes over the trade here. And we can kind of see how, how, how datings are, are how the bloomer iron production is going down uh, later and later, the farther away you get from the from the mining districts, but st still you, so there is some kind of wave going on there, you can see. And also at the same time, they were unlucky now that the peasants out on using peasants, because at the same time, uh, comb makers in the towns, they are switching from antler of reindeer and elk and so on, to bones from slaughtered cows and other food waste material to make their combs and keep up their production. And the production and the pitfalls that are contemporary with the bloomery iron productions, they were probably very much used for capture elk and for their ant antler that was traded. So at the same time, two, two important markets are lost. The bloomery iron production goes down around 1200, the pitfalls go down around 1250. So there you can see that in the 13th century, there is a very receding market for the outland using peasants and they are face, of course facing severe problems. Uh, but we can also see that they are putting up a fight to and try to manage this new risk. So they, we can see, especially in the bloomer iron production, we can see that they are rearranging and introducing new and more efficient furnaces for instance, this very well built up furnace that almost looks like it takes off traits from a blast furnace. They are introduced uh, at that time uh, before they were very simple furnaces. And here is how it looks uh, from the top. And we can also here we can see that we have uh, purif purifying, we are purif purifying the iron at anvil stones at the, the pr production site, meaning that you're making it more efficient. And we also have indication that they, there was a community built, uh, there was a community built uh, um, iron forge that was kind of to where you took the purified iron uh, for further work. So it seemed, and, and also the pitfalls, uh, we can see that the pitfalls dating to around 800 to 1250, they are mostly single pitfalls. The big system of pitfalls, they are either older or younger. So, and the, the big pitfall system demanded a lot of cooperations on a larger scale than just the farmstead or maybe the hamlet. So we are, what we are, are guessing at is that they are introducing more bigger cooperation systems as a way, as a way of also trying to manage this risk and try to take back the market. That's, that's our hypothesis. Uh, but it didn't work. <laughs> they lost the market anyway. So, but when the improvements didn't work, they had to switch to other legs in their versatile, versatile economy. And that is mostly the agrarian use, outland use, such as the use of shielings. For instance, shielings that had been temporarily deserted were taken up again in the 14th century. We can see that there is an increase in grassing, both in pollen diagrams and also in when you're using the endocrinology to, to and see, see the fire, fire scars from when you're burning for improving the grassing. And these are coming more, more frequent. Um, 
we can see that haymaking is expanding and haymaking is of course the bottleneck for how many cattle how much cattle you can keep over winter and that is that is expanding a lot both on on the hard ground meadows but also on on uh, mires sedges uh, which they are also fertilizing now and by by flooding, for instance. And we can also see that there is an increase in cereal cultivation, both in the infields and also in fields in the outland. Uh, also in places where no sensible farmer today would ever dream of cultivating cereals. So we have some kind of strange chronology here that in the 14th century, when the rest of the world is experiencing a uh, uh, an agrarian crisis with the climate change and where, where uh, black deaths and so on and where where agriculture is reduced in these areas agriculture is in the case of cereal cultivation and cattle breeding is expanding so that's that could look very strange when you look on, on it from the outside and only see these this dating these datings so but it has to be seen in the context that this is the way of increasing this the agrarian side of the economy uh, is a response to the crisis of the market production. This is, a, as we thought, now we have a very tight narrative. We can explain what we are seeing and so on. But um, of course, it's never like that. We had uh, a little problem that we kind of chose to turn a blind eye to it was only one site you know we had several sites going in indicating the same results saying the same things and then it was this site this is Bakka Dammen uh, it is histo historically known very late shielding very young shielding from the 19th century uh, but the pollen analysis uh, that we made here uh, as you can see in the bottom, <laughs> told another story. The pollen analysis rather indicated that we are dealing with a small farmstead from around 400 AD, with quite where cereal cultivation is actually dominating. And this place is not located uh, in the river valleys with, with the sediment soil, it is located far up in the forest. There is a major contributory uh, to the Big River Claude Elven uh, running not far away from here, but not far away from this place, but it's still a very remote place in the forest. So that was, uh, and we were kind of saying we didn't really know what to do with that, this place. So uh, it's published, but we, in the context with the others, but we were kind of, well, you always have some things that you cannot explain. So we're turning a blind eye a bit to that one, but it was still, you know, nagging in the back of our head. And then you start doing some new research. Uh, this place, uh, it's a shilling with the name Kore Bols Säten. Uh, and the reason we investigated this site had nothing to do with the, that we expected it to be old or important or special in any kind of way. Uh, in fact, we thought it was would be a quite a young shielding. The reason is that this is one of the few living shielings today, and it's managed and owned by a very active uh, local group. And they have been, well, I think they've been asking me for 10 years, uh, when are you coming to us? When will you do research on our, on our shielding? When are you coming to us to see what we have here? And uh, after 10 years, we said, well, all right, let's go there and have a try and see what we are seeing. But we were really, really careful to communicate that we think all indication we have of this feeling is that it is a young feeling. Uh, but in a place like this, uh, it's very nice to be there. So when you are working, feel working there, you're kind of sometimes wondering, and, and I'm getting paid to be here. That's the good side of it. Uh, we started with a detailed mapping, of course, of house remains and, of course, going through the older, uh, old historical maps and so on. And we didn't see anything that really indicated anything then 
my guess was that we were dealing with the, the 17th century AD as at the oldest for this. We find some kind of house, some house foundation that seems to be a little bit older character like this one, but still we, uh, or maybe this one, uh, but still nothing that really spoke of an older age. But still it's a nice place to be there and, and the people who are managing this feeling were really happy they were there. Uh, there is one problem with this site, there is no mire in, in adjacent to them, so taking a pollen sample here required that we used the lake. And that meant doing it in the winter. And uh, that became quite adventurous. Uh, on the picture here you see our Icelandic paleobotanist Sigrund. Uh, and when we are taking this pollen analysis in the lake in the winter. It was a lot of snow and uh, there were two layers of ice and the first I lay the top, up top layer burst. So it was standing in water uh, doing all this. But it was very, very rewarding. And it, uh, when, uh, when we were presenting some, um, uh, the preliminary, for some preliminary results to the local group who were working there. That was one of the funniest moments. Well, one of the most rewarding moments you have when you're you're standing in front of a, a community who really loves their place and have been working for it and say, well, I was wrong. This is not a young shilling. On the contrary, it's the oldest datings we have so far. Because around, at the, according to the pollen analysis, around 100 BC or it, up to AD, this was the this was a settlement of a small farmstead or shielding, farmstead shielding, we're not sure really, uh, that was established with grazing and cereal cultivation, including the cultivation of hemp. And of course that was became very popular because, uh, well, hemp in Latin, that's cannabis. And then everybody liked that. So when I visit the shielding horrible set and today, people that tell me, you have to know, this is a very old shielding and they were producing cannabis here. So the cannabis really took off in, in local lore very soon. Around 500, 500 AD we can see the grassing increases and then again following the general pattern in the Viking Age, early Middle Ages, the use of the shielding decreases and then increases again in the late Middle Ages. Uh, and of course this uh, pollen analysis made us uh, try to find, to excavate some of the houses in order to locate contemporary uh, uh, settlement that is at Corbusetten. So far we have not been successful, we make a new try this summer again here. Uh, so because we want to see what we have to get together with the, with the pollen analysis. Anyway, uh, of course, it's always nice to have old dating and to be able to communicate those things with a, with a local com local organizations and people working trying to to take care of their shielding today. But it was also that these datings fitted very well with the with what is also found out in the other part of the pro uh, in other data produced by the project, the ongoing project contesting marginality, um, because. Increasingly, uh, with all these new methods of uh, where you can trace origin of artifacts, nicofacts, DNA, isotopes, and so on, and uh, also re-evaluation of Iron Age uh, um, burial materials in central Sweden and so on, uh, we could see that very much of the grave material in these richly furnished graves actually or originates from outlands. There are game walrus, uh, there are gaming pieces of walrus tusks, there are uh, bear, uh, bear furs, <laughs> uh, remains of bear skins deposited, there are uh, lynx skins, etc. etc. Uh, so what we, what we see here is that in the early to, to middle Iron Age there appeared to have been a great demand for the products available in the big forested areas in inland Scandinavia that were hunted, processed and, and then traded to the elite and also to the, 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 the social groups a little bit below the elite. 
And that makes us talk about today resource colonization, that it is the demands for these products that is triggering people to move in and settle into to these uh, uh, inland boreal areas. And that also could explain, explain why we find, uh, well, we think that both Kårebosäten and Backadammen are part of this system of this resource colonization because they are settled well for that. And it could also explain the reason for cultivating hemp at Kårebosäten, simply because you needed rope for packing furs and other goods. So we have to, we have to re-evaluate <laughs> Our, our previous interpretation. We are not saying that this system, what we say, is invalid. We're still talking about the innovation package uh, for the kind of permanent settlement, but, but we are dealing with some kind of other trigger than hunger for land uh, or need to find new places to settle and build an economy in the farms that, uh, to, to be a peasant, to be, create new farmsteads. But you have other driving forces that makes you go there in the first place. And that is the resource, uh, the resources you want to extract for trade, for the luxury goods trade. And then you are also in connection with that, you are establishing uh, farmsteads using this system with shillings and uh, pitfalls and outland use and, and so on, as well as a way of making a living. And then you, you are, uh, and later on, uh, when the demand for this luxury product is not as high, then you also start this big scale, almost industrial, all industrial um, scale production of, of uh, everyday items such as bloomer iron and antler from elk. So, so we think that we are kind of having, we have discovered an earlier wave here and another driving force for uh, why you were settling these areas to in the beginning. And that's what we are calling resource colonization. That was um, what I had intended to say uh, now. And I think that you should have, maybe I need to clarify something. And that's the, that's the back side of sitting on Zoom that you don't see when you have to, when you're unclear in, in the faces of your, the people who are listening. So, uh, if you have things I need to clarify, or if you have other questions, or if you want to challenge what I'm saying, I'm, I'm open for, for that now. Thank you very much so far.